So let's see. Um, I make things. I don't design. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a designer. I'm a fabricator. So um, I was a little surprised when I got this invite. I was actually at the San Diego airport, terminal number one, southwest terminal. And I got this email from Odyssey who said, would you like to speak on this conference we have about design of airports? And I looked around me and I thought to myself, you mean people design these things? <coughs> and if you've been to that terminal, I think you know what I mean. I actually had about 40 minutes to kill trapped in that terminal, so I figured I would spend most of my time in the line at Einstein's Bagels trying to get a cup of coffee, which I don't think I made, I don't think I made it. Um, <coughs> but, Fast forward a little bit while I was trying to think about how I'm going to introduce what I have to offer to this conference. And I ended up in uh, Phnom Penh just a couple days ago with a flight on my way from there back to San Francisco through Singapore and Hong Kong. So I thought, oh, neat, I can do a little research for my talk. And so when I got back, I, yesterday, I, uh, I look at my iPhone, my big, my big data analytic tool here, and I went to that little app that Apple puts in there, and I saw how many steps I took to get from, you know, in Singapore, because they didn't do anything that whole day long except sit in an airplane and walk through the airport. And it divided it into two because the date changed in the transportation between Singapore and Hong Kong, and Singapore, I walked 5,100 steps. In Hong Kong, I walked 5,032 5, steps or something. I thought, wow, Hong Kong wins, right? Faster. Trouble was, in Hong Kong, I didn't change planes. You had to get off the plane. Then they send you on this route, God knows where or why, way the hell around, you know, with all kinds of people directing you on the way to make sure you don't get lost, back to the same place you started. So, you know, I don't go to airports to hang out or you know, to take my family to lunch. I mean, I go in airports to get in and out of airports as fast as I can. And it just isn't working for me. So I thought, I wonder, so I came here and, and and I was really, it was very refreshing yesterday and today to see the smart you know, people in this room who are thinking about how to make these things more human, more livable, how to deal with this sort of whole problem of, of you know, the time you have to spend in airports, make it as pleasant as possible. But I got to thinking, you know, there may be another approach, although it might not work for folks who rely on you spending a lot of time in airports because there's, you know, a lot of people who depend on that. Um, but there may be alternatives to how you sort of design these things so that you could conceivably look at a different way of doing it. And so that gets me to a different material system. And I work in composites, reinforced plastics, and throughout the last, since World War II, composites have pretty much dominated the marine industry, completely replaced, you know, wooden boat building for a whole bunch of reasons. There would not be a wind energy industry if it weren't for fiberglass. The transportation industry long ago embraced composites because it's of its lightweight formability and durability. I mean, it doesn't rust, doesn't rot, doesn't corrode. It's making sailboats that are light enough and strong enough to basically lift themselves out of the water and go over 50 miles an hour. Pole vaults wouldn't work. I mean, there is no such thing as a wooden pole vault anymore. Industrial products, and even things as simple as a cable to haul an elevator up, when they switch from steel to carbon fiber, 
it meant they could add 30 stories to the high rise because now all of a sudden the elevator didn't have to pick up the cable. It gets to a point where the cable becomes the biggest weight the thing has to deal with. So composites are a whole new material system. And they open the door, you know, where there's all this talk about, you know, big data and pattern recognition and electronics and software and all these other things that are happening. But nobody really talked about it, except Mario actually mentioned, I was so relieved, he mentioned material systems and prefabrication and configurability. And, I, you know, that's kind of what I'm suggesting that you folks take into account when your task was trying to figure out a way to get people in and out of these airports, because I think there might be some opportunities there that you could exploit. And I'm not sure exactly how, but I can tell you these things, these materials can do some amazing things. Um, and this is a lousy chart, hard to see, so I'm gonna just make it. The, the thing that makes composites special is not their strength per square inch, it's their strength per pound. Stiffness, um, tensile strength, a fraction of what traditional materials are. So you see at the bottom is steel, that little arrow, and you see carbon fiber way up at the top. Problem with carbon fiber is it's a lot more expensive, but if you really care about weight, and weight is a really big deal, then carbon fiber has got a place. We very rarely find a place for it in architecture because it's so expensive compared to glass, which isn't that much less strong. Um, but here's an example of how you leverage strength. This is a project we're working on right now. This is a high rise in Miami. It's the high rise that Zaha was, Hadid was visiting the project when she passed away a couple years ago. And uh, this is a sort of sculpted wall system that surrounds a swimming pool on the top floor of this residential tower. So it can't really be plaster because it's got, you know, hot water or warm water in the swimming pool. Um, so we got the job of building this thing. And the first thing that the, and, and in the construction documents, the architect had drawn this sort of really elaborate steel support structure to carry the weight of these decorative panels. And we pointed out that, you know, yes, they are decorative panels, but they are made out of this more remarkable material. It has strength properties that are very rarely optimized in construction. Let's see what happens if we do a finite element model of this thing and measure the strength and try to calculate what it would take to get rid of the steel. So this is how it ended up. We have, instead of this whole mess of steel, we have a connection point at the top, a mid-span connection, and a connection at the bottom. And the rest of the structural work is done, or support structure, it's not load-bearing, but it's, help, it's carrying itself in this case. The rest of it is done by the composites. So, you know, we, we've been pretty busy over the last 35 years, and we've never gotten a job because we were more expensive than the other guy. It's always because of things like this, where you can kind of figure out a way to use these new materials in different ways. I mean, you don't see suspension cables made out of concrete because it's just the wrong material. I'm suggesting that composites can change the whole way you think about how a building is built. Um, there's tools like this. There's a design guide uh, because the industry is beginning to come to wake up to the fact that the construction industry, the composites industry is waking up to the fact that the construction industry is sort of like the biggest industry in the world. So why aren't they spending more time and effort introducing their products to folks like yourselves? Um, this is a job we just finished in San Francisco. This is the largest use of composites on an exterior building facade, a multi-story building in, this is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art edition in San Francisco. This is a concert hall at Stanford where some of these panels um, are 50 foot square, made up of matched molded panels that bolt together on site. So there's really no joints to speak of. Um, and the ceiling is also all composite. It's a little hard to see, but that's the aquarium tank at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and that's even harder to see, but that's the aquarium itself. That's a million gallon 
fiberglass aquarium tank. Um, this is an experimental building we're building with the with a student uh, at CCA in San Francisco. It's a floating laboratory. It's, it's, it's designed to sort of explore the possibility of buildings that float on the water that can, don't need a foundation, that don't need to worry about sea level rise. And this will be going to the Maldives for a project that's going to be exploring how they might be able to help mitigate some of the impacts of, of uh, global warming through the use of these materials. Um, I take it this is counting down. Yes, it is. 421. So I got a little bit more time. Um, the slide on the right, interestingly enough, is the result of a collaboration on this project with a bio, uh, bio, marine biologists who have discovered that perhaps underwater structures that are made by man don't have to think of the things that grow on them as the enemy, which is the way the marine industry is traditionally thought of as barnacles and sea life. Maybe if you design the bottom, the shape of this thing in a way that is scientifically analyzed, you can promote the growth of native species in certain biological environments. And so what's happened here is that just by serendipity, the use of the materials plus the students' effort to try to design a building plus the idea that the marine biologists are thinking about how they can promote sea life, the right kind of growth, has resulted in a very interesting project that is basically learning how to minimize the, the, the habitat compatibility of invasive species in San Francisco Bay and how it might be able to promote an, an organisms that are native to that area. Um, so all, you know, I don't know, it's kind of neat, fun project. This is a job we're working on right now too. This is in Tulsa and this gives you a little bit of a sense of the complexity of the scale and, uh, the, and the complexity. I mean, this is sort of like the quintessential crumpled up piece of paper as best I can tell. But, it, but it's made up of 125 fairly large individually shaped panels. And it's basically a roof for a, for a pier in a park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But it may be the most complicated project we've ever done. I don't know, it's got these panels all bolt to each other and the structure is, the loads are traveling through the composite part between the vertical columns. So it's a interesting challenge. Um, so how does all this apply to airports? And it reminded me of a project that the students at UCLA in the Super Studios program did a couple years ago where they were tasked with sort of reinventing uh, manufacturing for Boeing. And Boeing um, invited them in and the the students were encouraged to think about how they might be able to design a building uh, that would solve some of the problems that Boeing was having to, you know, address some of the issues that they were having. And to think about the buildings as being movable, not so much just the boat, the plane. What would happen if the buildings came to the plane rather than the plane to the building? And it, even though this is a manufacturing environment, it got me thinking, well, you know, I suppose that would not be a bad question to ask in terms of the actual airport itself. What if the airport didn't just sit there like, you know, a big concrete block? What if it actually could come apart and move? What if it could reconfigure itself? What if the people got a way to, I mean, it's one of the most ridiculous things to me is the fact that when they load an airplane, they leave one of the doors closed. You know, I mean, why is that? I guess it, I'm, there's probably a reason. Maybe it's because those jetways are so expensive. But um, they came up with all kinds of interesting ideas. And here's one student's concept. And you know, I'm not advocating that this is necessarily going to work. I'm only saying that these are the kind of things you can think about when you decouple a building from its foundation and you start thinking about buildings as something that can be mobile just like the plane itself. And so you think, well, this is fanciful, sort of futuristic, you know, I mean, someday maybe.
but those days are not that far away. And I found a slide that I actually got the folks here to put into the last slide in this presentation. And it's this building. This is in the Arctic. It's not beautiful, but it doesn't need to be. This is a laboratory and this travels around on the surface of the Arctic. Um, and it's made out of all composites and it's got skis on it. I don't think it's very fast, but I think it's interesting to think that it is possible to build portable buildings that are pretty good size. And I have actually gone, it appears, over time, I'm sorry, by a few seconds anyway. Thank you very much.